Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you in your homes across the city and a very warm welcome to all of you that have found us online. We're so pleased that you've joined us this morning. My name's Chris Kilby. I have the great delight and joy of leading Life Church, and it's great to be able to be with you this morning. We're going to be digging into the Bible now so you can get a Bible ready and start opening Revelation chapter three. Uh, in fact, this is the final message in a series we've been looking at about what Jesus thinks is important to the local church. You know, in the book of Revelation, Jesus dictated uh, some letters, seven letters to the Apostle John to give to the seven churches in what is now modern day Turkey. And today we're coming to the final letter. Uh, so this is our final chance to have a look at uh, the final things that Jesus wanted to say uh, to the church. And so this is our final opportunity to do that. Now, I don't know about you, but when I eat a meal, I love to go around the plate and I taste a little bit of everything. And so you can pretty much guarantee that when I come to the end of my meal, there will be a small amount of everything left just for me to savour for that last mouthful. Now, my youngest son, he's completely the opposite. He will get his plate full of food in front of him and he'll assess it and he'll eat first what he likes the least. And so he'll sa always save the best till last. Last week, he ended up with just one whole pie crust left on his plate because he wanted to enjoy that bit. And my question is this, when we come to this last church, this last letter in the book of Revelation, did Jesus save the best till last? Well, no. Unfortunately, he didn't save the best till last, most definitely not. We're going to read about the church that got the hardest rebuke from Jesus of all the churches that he wrote to. You know, Ephesus, he wrote to them and uh, he told them that they'd lost their first love, but he still commended them for their faithfulness and for their hard work. And then Pergamum, he wrote to them and they were tolerating false teaching, but he still commended them for their faithfulness. And then it comes to Thyatira and he they were tolerating controlling people, but he still commended them for their faithful service. Uh, and Sardis, even though he said they were dead, <laughs> he still said there were a few faithful people among them. And yet we come to this church that we're going to read about now, the church in a place called Laodicea. Now, what did they get in their encouragement inbox? Nothing. Nada. Zilch. Zero. Not a single positive word did Jesus have to say about this church. In fact, they were so far from being a church that I'm tempted not to even call it a church. I'm not sure if it even still was one. So let's get our Bibles. Revelation chapter three. And I'm just going to read about the church in Laodicea. Chapter three, verse 14, I'm starting at. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, these are the words of the Amen the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I've acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realise that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who overcomes, I give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So quite a strong letter, strongly worded letter written to this church in Laodicea. You know, it's the last of the letters, as I've mentioned, and it's the last of the letters for a reason. It's the last of the letters because it was the last place to come to geographically. If you imagine Asia Minor at the time, there were lots of trade routes and lots of roads, and they would follow the valleys through the roads. And as you follow the path of the churches that we've looked at, we've now come to the furthest and the top of the crescent, if you like. People didn't go trade routes across the mountains. It would be crazy. This is the route, the valley route, the trade route. Um, but there's some things that you need to know about Laodicea. Firstly, it was a, it was a very well-off place. It was known for its gold. Um, 
it was a very well-off town. Jewish history books uh, tell us that the temple taxes that were collected there in the town of Laodicea amounted to over 30 kilos of gold. And so it's a significantly wealthy place. Um, Tacitus, the Roman historian, he tells us that when there was a, a devastating earthquake in Laodicea, uh, the, Roman, uh, the Roman authorities attempted to get in touch with them to say, we'll send money to help. And you know what Laodicea said? No, thanks. We don't need your money. We've got plenty of money. And they actually refused the offer of money to rebuild. And they managed to rebuild the whole town of Laodicea without any help from the Roman authorities. That's how well off they were. I mean, if you think America, think Beverly Hills. If, you, if you're living in Hampshire, think uh, Winchester. The, the, the posher parts of Winchester, you know, materially very content. That's what this place in Laodicea was like. Also, it was known for its wool. They produced a particular type of black wool there that was used for expensive ceremonial clothes. And that was exported all over the region. And it, they were famous for it. So it was known for its gold. It was known for its wool. It was also known for a particular kind of eye salve that, that was known to bring healing to different eye conditions. So it would be rubbed on the eyes and eyes would be made better. And again, they were, they were famous for that. And that was exported everywhere. Um, it's also worth noting something about its geography. It was, it, was, it was further inland than the other churches that we've looked at. And as a consequence, it was further from any kind of water sources. And uh, Colossae was about 10 miles down the road. They had uh, fresh water there and springs there, but it was that would be too far for water to come to Laodicea. There were some water sources about five miles away, and those water sources were kind of hot water springs. And uh, so, so very clever. I mean, we tend to look back with a little bit of what C.S. Lewis calls uh, chronological snobbery and we tend to look back and think that things were um, kind of undeveloped in the past but but what happened in in Laodicea was they built a five mile underground aqueduct bringing water from these springs all the way down to Laodicea now sadly because they were hot springs they brought with them lots of different minerals and often the the pipe work became quite uh, filled with these kind of calcareous deposits and so by the time the water actually arrived, it actually ended up making quite a few people quite ill. So even though they had a water supply, it wasn't the best water supply that you could have. But, but, but it was known for this. Um, and let, I mean, you might ask, well, why are you telling us about the history and, and the geography of, of Laodicea? Well, it's because in this letter you might have picked up Jesus mentions some of these things that Laodicea was famous for. But that's not where he starts. He starts like he does with all the letters bringing us into an understanding of who Jesus is and his deity. Uh, and so he starts off by saying this, and he needed to because this was something that the, the church there had forgotten. The church in Laodicea had forgotten really who Jesus was. That's why they got such a harsh rebuke. And so he's reminding them. They'd lost sight of it, so he's reminding them. And this is what he says in verse 14. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. So amen, that's an interesting word, isn't it? We often say the word amen, don't we? At the end of a prayer, it's kind of like an agreement. Yeah, um, you know, like a so be it, or maybe in the words of John Lennon, let it be. It's got that kind of feel to it when we say that word. You know, many Pentecostal Christians say amen before they've got anything to agree to. I went to a church recently and the pastor just stood up in front of the congregation and said, amen. And the whole congregation said, amen. And then he said, amen. And then all the congregation said, amen. And I thought this is a bit like being at the panto. You know, he's behind you. No, he isn't. Yes, he is. No, he isn't. But anyway, I love a bit of order, audience participation. So I joined in loudly with the amens, but I wasn't quite sure what we were amen but it's not about no bad word to say uh, any place but um, the important thing is not that um, the important thing is that Jesus describes himself as the amen so what does it actually mean well the clue is in the next two words that he used to describe himself he describes himself as the true witness so the Hebrew word amen carries this notion of truth of certainty of faithfulness that's kind of what it comes down to in terms of it's the essence of the word and so let me give you an example when you hear Jesus saying at the beginning of his teaching truly truly I say to you or in older translations verily verily I say to you that's the word amen it means somehow he's 
that he's truly true. He's, he's faithfully faithful. He's certainly certain. There's something of a, a magnitude of his faithfulness and his certainty and his truth that is very reliable. I guess a fuller translation of the word amen, amen would be something like this. Thus it is and ever shall be so. This is how it is and let it stay that way. It's got that kind of feel. So, so when we're coming to Jesus, he's introducing us to his own identity here. He's declaring himself to be truly true, certainly certain, faithfully faithful, a faithful representation of God. He really is God. You know, we, we often see Jesus referred to in different ways, but Paul refers to him as, as, as this kind of representation of God, the fullest representation of God. And so in, in, in the book of Colossians, Paul says, he is the image of the invisible God. So somehow Jesus makes God truly visible. And we get a real picture of what God's like when we look at him. Uh, similarly, Jesus himself said, I and the Father are one. So we've got this idea that Jesus really is God in the truest sense of the word. And, and it's through Jesus, because he's the amen, it's through Jesus that every one of the promises of God is established. It's, it all happens through Jesus. And you know, if you're an onlooker to the church today and you're looking in on us, this is really important. Here we are in these strange days of isolation and you might be you might be thinking, what is this all about? What is life really about? What is actually true? What is real? What is reliable? What, what, can, I, can I just say something? You will never ever find anything or anyone more true, more reliable, more faithful than Jesus himself and the promises he gives over your life. I wanna urge you today, come to know him today. You can have an encounter with one who is truly true. And he also describes himself, interestingly, as the ruler over God's creation. You know, this is so important for all of us to hear today, right here, right now. OK, for all the chaos that you see around you, there is a ruler in creation. There is one who is overseeing everything. God is not absent in the days of coronavirus. He is present in the days of coronavirus. Virus. He is in authority. He is ruling. And I thank God that in such strange days, when so much is changing around us, there is one who is stable, who is strong, and who is in authority over the raging nations. Now, I'm going to give you a two minute question for discussion now, and I want you to just have a think about this question. Where is God in this current pandemic? Where is God in it all? And I'm going to give you two minutes to discuss that, and then I will be back.
Okay, folks, I hope you came up with some conclusions there as to where God is in this pandemic. And remember, I was saying Jesus is the amen. So he's the, the fulfillment of all the promises of God. And he's also the ruler over God's creation. Right now, he's ruling and reigning. And from that position of authority, Jesus has some pretty strong things to say to this church in Laodicea. He basically, let me reread it, verses 15 and 16, because it's pretty strong. It's pretty strong. Where are we? Verses 15 and 16. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. That literally, the words literally means it makes him want to throw up. It makes him want to vomit. So Jesus is saying to them, you are lukewarm and it makes me want to hurl. You know, what's this about? Well, this is all about their zeal and their passion for who he is. Remember, I said they've forgotten that Jesus is the amen. They've forgotten that Jesus is this true representation of the Father. They've forgotten it. And so they've just been doing things in their own kind of self-satisfied way, their own kind of half-hearted way, maybe sometimes in a bit of a religious way, but without any conviction about Jesus and who he is and why they're doing it. They're doing it just because it's comfortable and it's easy. And Jesus says it makes him sick. Lukewarm is the phrase he uses. Just think about that for a moment. Lukewarm. Now, I love a cup of tea, but I love a hot cup of tea. If you bring me a cup of tea that is lukewarm, that is going straight down the drain. And, and similarly, I love a cold beer. I love a cold beer, but please, please, nobody give me a lukewarm beer because it will just go, it'll come straight out again. Do you understand? Jesus is saying there's something unpalatable about this church here that is lukewarm. This is how Jesus feels about this church in Laodicea that has, has shut him out completely in favour of some kind of religious comfort without any real challenge. Now, remember, this is Laodicea. Do you remember what I said about the pipework that brought the water to Laodicea? This aqueduct that carried the water from five miles away. Now, by the time this water arrived, it was pungent and it was lukewarm and it made people ill. This church in Laodicea is exactly the same as the water that the people in Laodicea were drinking. It made Jesus sick. You know, this Laodicea has often been called the church that made Jesus sick. But why such a strong reaction? Well, it shows us something about how Jesus views his identity and how he feels about it when we get his identity wrong. You know, there are many today that have a wrong view of Christ. Now, I'm not talking just about those that are not yet to become Christians. Of course, they've got a wrong view of Christ. I'm talking about people who claim to have some kind of understanding of Christ, but misrepresent him. You know, there are many today that describe themselves as churches, but they have shut out the Christ. Let me give you an example. The Mormons. The Mormons say they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe that Jesus is God. He's left the building as a consequence. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they teach that Jesus is a created son, not part of creation, not the agent of creation. Now, both these groups claim to believe the Bible, but they don't teach what the Bible says about Jesus. And so Jesus has left the building. You know, any cult or any church which makes claims about Jesus that Jesus didn't make, or which teaches things about Jesus that Jesus didn't teach, or which allows things which Jesus wouldn't allow, or which doesn't allow things that Jesus encouraged, it makes Jesus sick. His words, not mine. And as a consequence, Jesus has left the building. Do you know, that's why in verse 20, he says, here I am. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. I stand at the door. Look, if there's anyone in there that will come and hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and I'll eat with that person and they'll eat with me. 
You know, we often think of that verse as being about salvation. You know, Jesus is somehow outside of our human heart. And if we hear him, then then if we open our hearts to him, he'll come in and have fellowship with us. Well, there's an element of that, but that's not the context of the passage. That's not the context of the verse. The context of the verse here is, guys, you've got a church, but you've left Jesus outside. And he's outside rapping on the door saying, guys, remember me. Remember who I am. Knock, knock, knock. Let me back in again. If you'll open the door, it's not all lost I'll come in and we can have fellowship again but I'm outside I'm not even in your church right now you see this is why it's such a rebuke for the church there in Laodicea because he's saying you have become so self-satisfied you have become so hypocritical you have been relying on your own strength relying on your own money building your lives on all the wrong foundations and as a result I've left the building That's what he's saying. This church has shut out Jesus. Do you know any church that becomes self-satisfied, hypocritical, could fall into exactly the same trap? And I dare say that this is the place that our nation has arrived at in the spring of 2020. Look at verse 17 for a moment. Let me read this to you. Verse 17. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. If there was ever a phrase to describe where our nation has got to in these days, it could be that. It could be that. You see, this letter speaks into our situation right now. For many in our nation and for many in the nations of this world, this last few months has been a wake up call and it has been a reality check. And all the things that we thought we valued, all the things that we thought we relied on, all the things that have we've depended on have suddenly changed and it has to make us question. It has to make us ask the question, what is really important in life? You see, this letter could be speaking into our idols right now. He says, guys, you say you're rich and you don't need anything. And that that could be true for our world. We're self-satisfied. And I say, yeah, okay. But do you know what? Coronavirus does not choose its victims by their bank balance. It is an indiscriminate virus. And you know, even those who have relied on their material wealth. As the economy nosedives, we know that so many people will be so deeply affected. You see, if money is your foundation, I want to remind you, it is an unreliable foundation. It always has been and it always will be. In reality, if money is our foundation, we are no different to this church in Laodicea. Jesus says quite literally they're, 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 they're blind, pitiful, wretched and naked. You know, if you've been building your life on, on wealth, on material possessions, on money, I want to shout out to you in the most <laughs> gracious and loving way that I know possible. Wake up! It is not a secure foundation. Jesus says that quite literally you will get caught with your eyes shut and your pants down. That's what he says, naked and blind. So what's the solution? Because Jesus always gives a solution. He always gives us the the dusk before the dawn. He always gives us the night before the morning. He always gives us the fear before he speaks a word of hope into it. And here's where he brings us to the solution. Because he he comes back to the things, <laughs> interestingly, his attention to detail, he comes back to the things that Laodicea was famous for and uses them as an illustration for the solution of how to get your life right. And he says this, gold, starts with the gold. Remember, it's a wealthy place. He says, instead of that, he says, buy from me 
gold refined in the fire. This is the gold of faith. This is about faith. This is about being on the adventure of faith with Jesus, going through a, a furnace that's been tested and proven and everything that you live for when you live for Jesus becomes worthwhile, purposeful. It's been refined, he says, on a fire. This is about being on the adventure of faith with God. You know, that adventure could start right here, right now, today. You can pray with me at the end and you can start that event, adventure of faith. And instead of having the gold of this world that is temporary and that fails and fades, you could have the gold of the faith in Jesus that lasts eternally. He also speaks about clothes. He says, come and be clothed. And in this time, he says, not with the black clothes, not with those black clothes that are made in Laodicea. This is about white clothes. White clothes in the scriptures always speak of cleansing. They always speak of forgiveness. They always speak of covering our shame. Remember, Jesus said that this church in Laodicea was naked. And he's saying, come on, I don't want you to be in shame. I want to clothe you with my righteousness. So you can receive the gold of faith. You can receive the, this forgiveness that comes with these new clothes. And then finally, do you remember I was saying about that eye salve that Laodicea was famous for? Do you remember Jesus said they were blind? And so he says, hang on a minute. No, no, no. I can give you salve. I can cure your, not your physical blindness, your, your spiritual blindness. I can, I can take away the fact that you're blind to things of God, things of faith, and I can make you see. Do you remember John Newton's very famous hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. This is a metaphor for suddenly coming alive and seeing who Jesus is. And Jesus says, I can give you this salve now and you will really see who I am, who you are, what you were made for, what your destiny is. And I believe that is what God is doing in some of our lives right now, right even in this moment. You know, Jesus, through the, the cross of Easter Sunday, and through sorry through the cross of good friday and the resurrection of easter sunday has made a way for us to have our eyes completely open for us to see and be not just physically alive but now beautifully fully alive and maybe just maybe that's going to happen for you for the first time today you know sadly that church in laodicea they shut him out don't shut him out today. My plea to you is to hear that cry as he knocks. If you hear my voice, I'll come in and I'll have a meal with you. Hear his knock. Don't make the same mistake they made. Come to know Jesus for who he really is, the amen and the ruler of creation. Don't rely on the things of this world anymore. You can see in these recent months, they are not a sure foundation. Trust him. And I appeal to you today to know him. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And in this prayer, you can have your eyes opened. You can receive these new clothes of forgiveness. And you can receive the gold of an adventure of faith with him. Just pray with me. Lord Jesus, I recognize today just who you are. And today, I believe in you. I no longer want to build my life on an uncertain foundation. I want to come to the one who is truly true, certainly certain, and faithfully faithful, the Amen. I want to the, come to the one who is the ruler of creation not subject to it. And I want to submit my life to you. I ask you to forgive me of my past. And today I choose to believe in you and I ask you to forgive me. Take away my soiled clothes and my nakedness and my shame and give me those white clothes of redemption and forgiveness. Lord, take away my dependence on material things and the things of this world and help me to find the true adventure of faith in you. And I ask you today to rub that salve on my eyes and remove my spiritual blindness so that like John Newton, I can say I once was blind, but now I see. 
I thank you that your death on the cross has made all of this possible. And today I choose to follow you. Amen. Amen. Now, guys, it's been wonderful to be with you. And if, if you prayed that prayer with me at the end and you'd like some follow up, there's a there's a prayer button on the on the online that you can just click on and somebody can pray with you right now. If you've prayed that maybe for the first time, then you can let us know and we can get you some support and some help. And to those that are already members of Life Church, I, I, I just want to urge you, let's never forget who Jesus is. Let's not be lukewarm in anything that we say or do. Let's keep our spiritual passion in these days and let's keep serving him with everything that we have. God bless you and your families. And I pray you all have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless.